Hello class, this is Dr. Fenton. In this video, we will cover chapter 12, which discusses differential analysis, the key to decision making. Now, as always, make sure you read the chapter in detail and use this video to understand better the key points of the chapter as well as the examples given within the chapter. So let's get started. Now, there are several key concepts we need to understand before we go through the rest of the chapter. So the first one, as you can see, is that every decision involves choosing from among at least two different alternatives. So you need to either decide, are you going to make the product yourself or buy the product from a supplier? Also, should you keep or drop a, a product or segment of the business? So you need to identify exactly what your alter alternatives are. Next, we need to understand what relevant costs are and also what relevant bis, uh, benefits are. The relevant cost, as you can see, will be a cost that should be considered when making decisions. So what cost is relevant to the alternatives that you're deciding upon? The next relevant benefits, very similar, except on the benefit side, a benefit that should be considered when making decisions. Let's add to that the next concept, because they're very, very close, a differential cost and differential revenue. Now, a differential cost is a cost, a future cost, that differs between any two alternatives. So it can be a difference in materials cost, a difference in labor cost, but a cost that will differ between the two alternatives that you're considering. Also revenue, same way. Future revenue that differs between any two alternatives. So if you're deciding whether or not to drop a product line or a segment of the business, you would lose that revenue. So the revenue would differ between the two alternatives and the two alternatives would be keep that division or that product or eliminate it. An avoidable cost is one that can be eliminated if you choose a certain alternative. And again, this is a differential cost or and also a relevant cost. So these concepts and these definitions are very, very connected. An incremental cost right here is a, an increase in cost between two alternatives. It's also relevant. Key concept number four, a sunk cost. A sunk cost is one that has already been incurred and it cannot be changed by any decision made now or in the future. So a sunk cost sometimes is very hard to ignore. Maybe you just purchased a new machine but now you're thinking about upgrading machines to buy a new one. If you're stuck with that old machine uh, it's a sunk cost. You've already paid for it. Now you could sell it. That would be a differential revenue. But the cost you paid for the old machine that you know is fairly new still is a sunk cost. It's not going to make any difference in the future. You've already paid for it. Key concept number five. You're looking for future costs and benefits that do not differ between alternatives. So you're looking for the items that really combine the, the, the previous ones. Are they relevant? You know, do they make a difference between decisions? You know, are there differences? Is it a future revenue you're giving up or you might be able to receive? A future cost you have to pay for that's, that's new. So you need to identify the items that are relevant and ignore the items that are irrelevant in your decision. And finally, we have something called an opportunity cost. This is the potential benefit that is given up when one alternative is selected over another. Now this opportunity cost is usually not found in accounting records, but they are a type of cost that differ between alternatives and you might be giving this opportunity up. So if you decide on alternative number one, whatever you could earn from alternative number two, you're giving that up. It's not a cost you're going to record you know, in the accounting records, but it is, it is a cost you need to consider before you make the decision. Let's look at an example to try to identify, identify the relevant cost. Now, Cynthia is currently a student in an MBA program in Boston, and she wants to visit a friend in New York over the weekend. So she needs to decide how much will this cost me. She could drive or she could take the train. So her car now, um, 
her, her depreciation on the car, if you get down to that detail, is $2,800. And she drives, and that's per year, and she drives usually 10,000 miles per year. So it's 28 cents a mile for depreciation. Cost of gasoline, 10 cents uh, per mile, the way she computed it. And so annual cost of the insurance, 1380 per year. Divide that by 10,000 miles, so 13.8 cents per mile for insurance. Maintenance and repair, she estimated at about 6.5 cents per mile. And if she goes to New York, her parking fees, oh no, this is still her, her, uh, her uh, current amount she's paying. She's paying in Boston $45 per month to park, and she's there eight months, so that's her parking cost. So her average cost per mile is 61.9 cents, almost 62 cents per mile. Other data, if she does not drive a car, then her uh, she can save eight cents per mile on the wear and tear on that car. If she takes a train, the round trip ticket, $114. Uh, how do you place a dollar amount on the benefit to relax on the train and do some reading and studying? Cost of putting the dog in a kennel while gone, $80. And you know what what kind of value can you put on having the benefit of using your car in New York once you get there instead of using the subway or something you have your car available. But she has to park in New York that can be a hassle and when she does park in New York it's $25 a day. Let's put all this together. Come down here. So let's look at the relevant cost. If she drives then she has to of course pay for gasoline she estimated that to be 10 cents per mile, so $46. Maintenance and repair, here's her six and a half cents per mile, times the miles driven there and back, $29.90. Reduction in the resale value of the car, wear and tear, she estimated at eight cents per mile, so $36.80. Cost of parking in New York, $50. So to drive her car to New York, it would cost $162. We did not put in here depreciation. It's not a relevant cost. If she takes the train to New York, then her out-of-pocket cost $114. So here are her relevant costs. It would cost her $162.70 to drive her car to New York or to take the train $114. So this is just the financial concern. You can see she would save $48.70 not driving her car but then you take into consideration the convenience of having a car in New York. Would that outweigh the $48.70? That's for her to decide. So this is just a way to try to identify out of all the information given to you, uh, what's relevant. Her insurance cost, not relevant. Depreciation, not relevant. Her parking fees at school, not relevant. So here are the ones she would really need to consider in driving the car to New York or taking the train to New York. Here's another example to help us identify differential cost. Here's the current situation. We produce and sell 5,000 units. Selling price $40. Direct materials cost 14. Direct labor 8. Variable overhead $2. And our fixed expenses $62,000. The alternative is to acquire a new machine, we rent it. If we rent the new machine, we still would produce and sell 5,000 units. Selling price is still 40, material is still 14. But here's the difference right here. With the new machine, we are more efficient. We do not have to use as much labor. So per unit, we only spend $5 per labor instead of eight. Variable overhead is the same. Fixed expenses are the same but we have to pay for the rent for the new machine, an extra $3,000. So you probably can start to see which items are relevant and which ones are not. And the ones that are relevant, of course, are the ones that differ between alternatives. Just two of those, the labor cost and the rent cost. Everything else is the same. They are irrelevant to the decision. But let's put all the numbers down in this chart and, and see the new situation coming down to net operating income compared with the situation with the new machine and the net operating income. You can see it goes up some. Sales, 200,000 with both alternatives, zero difference. Direct materials, 70 between both of them, zero difference. Direct labor though, $40,000 in total, 
in the current situation. With the new machine, we only spend $25,000 in labor. And that's the difference between the, the uh, difference in cost, eight per unit compared to $5 per unit. So $15,000 is the savings. Variable cost, the same. We're just trying to find the differences in the individual items. We're not going to bring these differences across here. Fixed expenses, no difference. The rent, though, we don't pay it currently. We would have to pay it if we acquired the new machine and rent. So you can see our advantage is $12,000. We save labor of fifteen, dollars and then we have to incur additional expense of rent of $3,000. So $12,000 is the increase in net operating income if we acquire the new machine. But we've gone through quite a few numbers here. We saw over here to, to the right, only two are relevant. So you can take this entire schedule, if you're trying to make the decision, take this entire schedule, make it look like this. Very, very simple. So if you identify only the difference in cost between the two alternatives, we only have two. The cost savings due to labor, it went from $8 to $5 a unit. So $3 savings times 5,000 units, $15,000 increase in benefit cost savings. We do have rent though that will go for the new machine. Uh, we're not currently paying any rent for a machine. This would cost $3,000. And so we are still better off by $12,000 if we acquire you know, rent and use the new machine. So this is the importance and the efficiency of using differential or relevant cost. You can take a schedule like this, turn it into one like this, get the same results and make the same decision. Now that we have dealt with relevant cost between decisions, let's add in revenue. So in this example, which is more detailed, so pay close attention to this, we have a product line that looks like it's not performing too well. So this company has three product lines, drugs, cosmetics, and housewares. It could be your local pharmacy store on the corner. It shows total results for the company when you combine all three of these product lines. But then we do have the numbers divided out between product lines. So just glancing at this, you're, see you're seeing that we are losing $8,000 because we are carrying the housewares lines. That's what it looks like. But we need more detail than this. We need to find out which items in this column are relevant. So you need to read the discussion down below and they start going through each of these. So think about what happens. If you drop the housewares line, you will lose revenue of $50,000, but you will save these variable cost of 30, but you still will lose contribution margin of $20,000. Okay, so that's easy to see. These aren't so easy. You need to dig into the details of these. If you drop the housewares line, will you actually save each of these costs? So read this discussion down through here and you'll find out that some you will save, others you will still incur. So for example, um, let's look at utilities. The utilities expense represents utilities cost for the entire company. The amount charged each product line is, is allocated based on space occupied, but here's the important part. It's not avoidable if the product line is dropped. So on these expenses right here for utilities, if you drop the housewares line, you still have to pay utilities. You will not save this money because it's for the whole store in general and you just allocated $1,000 based on space to the housewares line. The other two will end up picking up part of, you know, part of this. Let's look at what they say about salaries. Salaries represent salaries paid to employees working directly on the product so it says all the employees working in the housewares would be discharged, in other words, fired, if the product line is dropped. So, yes, you would save the $8,000 if you drop the housewares line because you would lay those employees off. So go through each of these in the reading and you'll see what they say about each of these expenses, the rent, the insurance, the general, and so forth. Once you do all that, you'll find out that here's the current situation. These are the costs not avoidable that you're going to incur whether you drop this line or not. So here are the avoidable costs. 
So out of all these costs for this housewares line, you would save salary cost, advertising cost, and you would save some insurance. But these other costs, utilities, depreciation, rent on the whole store building, general administrative, you would not save these. So you'd still incur these even if you dropped this product line. So you don't save as many costs as you first thought you would. Let's put this together. Here's the contribution margin lost, the fixed expenses uh, right here, the 15,000 drops in here that we could save. You would lose this revenue. We'd save these costs but you would have a financial disadvantage of dropping the housewares product line. You would lose $5,000 if you drop this line. Let me scroll back up. When you first saw this schedule, you said, I can save $8,000 if I drop this product line. No. The way the numbers work out, and it gets down to which of these costs are avoidable and which ones are not. And once you get into the details, which they explain in these items one through seven, then you find out here and then here that you would not save $8,000. You'd actually lose $5,000 if you drop this product line. Here's another way to look at it. Here's the current situation. Looks like we're losing $8,000. If we drop the housewares line, then we would still incur $13,000 and we would lose $5,000. So this is a summary, more detailed summary of what we did up here. And then they say, well, maybe it's better off to prepare a schedule like this if you have product lines. The difference is how we handle these common fixed expenses. These are fixed expenses you will incur anyway and you just allocate them to the different product lines based on some kind of um, member cost driver from earlier chapter, some kind of cost driver. Could be space or something. So maybe this is a better presentation of the company rather than, you know, again, sorry for the scrolling, rather than this. The same overall results, $20,000, but now we have better numbers than just these across the bottom because we split these out between relevant and not relevant cost, you know, irrelevant cost for the decision. Let's look at this again. We have a new term here called product line segment margin. What you're doing for each line of product here is coming up with how much it contributes to the overall company's uh, margin, you know, contribution margin. So the housewares, the one that looked like it was losing $8,000, is really contributing $3,000. We have revenue coming in, and yes, it has variable costs. So its regular contribution margin is 20. Its relevant cost, and they call these traceable fixed costs. The relevant cost for this company, $17,000. So we are covering this division's relevant cost. You know, they're traceable fixed cost. And so we generate $3,000 to help the company overall, which goes into this uh, item, you know, the, uh, the $20,000 net operating income. So this is just a, a, an example of, again, knowing how the numbers will react when you make a decision. Again, scroll back up. You look at this. First glance, yes, let's drop this product line. We'll save $8,000. Our profit will be $20,000. Then you find out by going through the detail as described in here, putting the numbers down, that you would actually lose uh, $5,000 if you drop that, drop that product line based on lost revenue and the cost savings. And you don't save as much cost as you lose in revenue. I guess I should call this contribution margin. Uh, but you still would lose $5,000. So that's the point of this part of the chapter. Let's look at another decision that might be made with the company. And this is, should we make the product ourselves or buy it from an outside supplier? This is the regular make or buy decision. So here are the numbers we start off with. Currently, we have a manufacturing process where we're making bicycles, making various parts. And this is not the only item that we make. But when we 
produce these uh, shifters we're talking about here, the shifters. The materials cost $6 per unit, direct labor, already you can see those numbers, supervisor salaries. So you have the per unit cost for all these costs, even the allocated overhead and depreciation. This is costing us $168,000 total to make these shifters. This is when you put all the cost in here. Now an outside supplier has come to us and said, we will make these 8,000 shifters for you, and then you don't have to make any of them. And we will charge you only $19 each for a total of $152,000. So it looks like, yes, if it's costing us $21 per shifter per unit to make, and we will only pay $19 per unit, yes, we should have the outside supplier make these for, for us, and we will save $2 per unit. Again, you have to dig into the numbers to decide if this is the proper decision to make. So let's look at this. For the 8,000 units, if we make them ourselves, then the materials will cost $48,000. The labor will cost $32,000. And again, we're taking the number of units that we would produce times the cost per unit. Even variable overhead comes into here. Supervisor salary also. You have the supervisor for this shift production area. If we buy the unit, we don't incur any of those costs. So all these costs are relevant to this decision. But look, the depreciation of the special equipment and the allocated overhead, they're saying is not relevant. Why? You read this, these two paragraphs. The equipment we have is being charged uh, off at like $16,000 depreciation expense per year. Now we already have the equipment, so if we buy from the outsider, we still have the equipment. So we still will have this charge. So the $16,000 depreciation is not a relevant cost to this decision. Now what would be relevant if, as it says in here, if we decide to sell that equipment and the salvage value would be relevant. We're not deciding that here, so it's not in the picture. But if we did, that would be a cost savings, you know, extra revenue if, if we buy it. You know, if, if we buy from the outside, we could sell the machine. But we're not assuming we're going to sell it, so the depreciation is not relevant. The overhead, this is overhead being incurred across the factory. So even though we have $40,000 allocated to this shifter production line, if we don't make it ourselves, we still incur the $40,000, and so that will be allocated to the other items that we are making. So that cost is not relevant. Let me scroll back up. So we're going from here. Yes, when you do full absorption costing that we talked about in an earlier chapter, this unit is costing us $21 to make. But is all this cost, at full 21, relevant if we have an option to buy from the outside. The first four are relevant, the last two are not. Because the last two are not relevant because we still will incur these costs whether we make the item ourselves or buy from the outside supplier. So once you put it all together, it cost us, relevant cost-wise, $112,000 to make. It would cost us $152,000 to buy from the outside supplier. So we are $40,000 better off by continuing to make it ourselves. That's a, that's a complete opposite decision we thought about earlier. Yes, full absorption costing is costing us $21 per unit. The supplier from the outside will charge only $19 per unit. But when you look at actually how much we would save, we would only save the cost related to materials, labor, variable overhead, and the supervisor's salary. We would not save depreciation or the general factory overhead. So $40,000 better off. If we buy from the outside, however, maybe we can do something with the excess capacity. So now if you're not making the shifters and you have like an empty area in the, in the factory building, this would be like idle capacity, you know, excess capacity. If you decide, you know what? If I buy from the outside, you know, the shifters, I can use that space to make some more bicycles. So they say here that they can make uh, a new cross-country bike 
that would generate a segment margin of $60,000. Now they've gone through the numbers and generated this one item for us, this one number right here for us. So $60,000 is what they could generate if they used that capacity that they were using in the shifter area. This is a relevant number. So let's put it into the mix. If we make it ourselves, the relevant cost is $112,000. And we are losing $60,000 in that capacity that we could be generating if we had that idle area in the factory to, to produce bicycles. So really, our total cost, when we, when we throw in this concept called, called opportunity cost, is $172,000. If you buy from the outside, $152,000. So in this scenario, when we use the excess capacity, the idle capacity, and take into consideration this concept called opportunity cost. You know, what are we giving up to make it ourselves? We're giving up $60,000. That's an extra cost. Take that into consideration. The decision switches. And so we have a financial advantage of buying from the outside supplier. The purchasing cost did not change, but if we make it ourselves, we're giving up $60,000. So we can buy it, use the excess capacity to generate $60,000 of more segment margin. Now let's look at a special order decision. We are currently making bicycles and the one we have now is called the City Cruiser. We sell it for $6.98 per bicycle and the unit cost is $5.64 and here's the breakdown. Materials, labor and overhead per unit cost $5.64 to make. Now the Seattle Police Department comes to us and says, we would like for you to produce 100 specially modified bikes for us and we would like to pay $5.58 per bike. Well, at first glance it says, well, at $5.58 per bike, bike, if that's our selling price and it cost us $5.64 to make, then no, we should not do this because we would lose money on this special order. But again, we need to look at the information for each of these and decide what are the relevant costs in this decision. The relevant revenues and the relevant cost. One thing here is very important. The variable portion of the above manufacturing overhead is $12 per unit. So of this $102 right here, only 12 is variable manufacturing cost. So really we're going to find out that the variable costs are the ones that are relevant. The fixed cost in here would not be relevant. Also, the police department says, if you produce the bike for us, we need some special modifications, and that would cost $34 in incremental variable cost per unit per bicycle. To design graphics, that would cost $2,400 for the entire job, the entire 100 bikes. And so we put all this together, and again, look at only the incremental cost plus the incremental revenues. First, the incremental revenues. They're willing to pay $558 per bike, 100 bikes, so $55,800 would be our revenue. Variable cost, yes, $372 per bicycle on materials, labor, $90,000. Here's the $12 we just talked about, variable overhead. Take that times 100 bikes, so $1,200. And here's the special modification we just talked about right up here. That per bicycle totals $3,400. So our total variable cost would be $50,800. Add to that that one time fixed cost of $2,400 for the entire job of 100 bicycles. And so our total incremental cost is $53,200. Compare that to our incremental revenue and we would have a profit of $2,600 in this special order. So a special order, you need to consider the impact of not just your total absorption cost where every cost is thrown in here. Because we're going to back out of here most of the overhead cost because most of the overhead cost is fixed. That would not change. The total fixed overhead cost, the fixed now, the total fixed overhead cost would not change if we produce this special order. The variable portion would, but not the fixed. So we look at this then we decide, yes, we should make this these bicycles for the police department because we'll have you know, additional revenue coming in the door.
Here's a new topic for us, and it's dealing with constraints. Now a constraint, as you can see, is a limitation under which a company must operate, such as limited available machine hours or machine time or raw materials that restricts the company's ability to satisfy demand. Okay, so what are we talking about? Let's look at a surgery center. This is called the National Health Service Center, and they can accept patients and perform surgery. This shows the capacity that they can handle in each of the various areas in their company. So they can receive 100 patients per day from general practitioner referrals. They can make appointments of 100 patients per day. So, so far, so good. But actual visits, they can only handle 50 visits per day. So you can see we're starting to be constrained here. We could book 100, but we only have the staff to have 50 visits per day outpatient visits. We could add 150 patients per day to the surgery rating, uh, waiting list, but then when you actually get to the surgery, this is what we're actually here to do, we can only, only handle right now 15 patients per day. So you can see this is a severe constraint, a severe restriction in the whole process. So no matter what you do to improve any of the other areas, you, know, you go from 100 here, 100, 100 uh, to 50, if you say, I'm going to make it where I can have uh, patients visit 100 per day, and you can only serve 15 per day, that's not going to help you. You're still limited right here. Follow-up visits, you can handle 60 per day, discharge 140 per day, but this is your limit. So if you're going to concentrate on anything in your company to improve, it's this area where you have constraints. So if you can get this up, then these you're trying to bring into the system can be treated, can be have, you know, have their surgery, and then you can continue with the follow-up and the discharge. Now let's look at an example where we can maximize profits when we have a constraining factor. So we have a production company where we make mountain paneers or touring paneers. You know, these are the items that go on the back of the bicycles, you know, you know like saddlebags. Selling price per unit is given to us, 25 for the mountain, 30 for the touring. Variable costs are given, contribution margin, we have $15 per unit for the mountaineer, the mountain paneers, and the touring paneers, $12. So the ratio, 60%, 40%. So it looks like we need to concentrate most of our production on the mountain paneers because they're generating $15 per unit contribution margin with a ratio of 60%. But we have a constraint here. Uh, let's see, the stitching machine is available for 12,000 minutes per month, and the company can sell 4,000 mountain paneers and 7,000 towing paneers per month. So that's the capacity, and that's the demand right here. We can sell this, but we can only have 12,000 minutes used. That, that's a constraint here. Producing up to these two totals, we would need to have 15,000 minutes that we don't. We only have 12,000. So hopefully you see this. We could produce, and if we could produce these, we could sell all these, but we would need 15,000 minutes. We only have 12,000 minutes on this machine. That's a constraining factor. So what we need to do is to analyze this minute category, this constraining factor, a little bit more. These machines, or the, these products on the Mountain Paneer, if we produced 4,000 and they take two minutes per paneer, per unit, we would need 8,000 minutes. On the Touring Paneers, 7,000, but they only require one minute, so we only need 7,000 minutes. So you can start to see that while these have a higher contribution margin per unit, they take more units in other words, more minutes of that constraining factor. So how do we analyze this? Well, if we have a contribution margin of $15 per unit for the mountain paneers, and they take two minutes to produce one unit, then we only have a contribution margin per unit of the constraining constrained resource, the stitching minutes, of $7.50 per minute. The touring premieres, on the other hand, uh, other hand only had $12 per contribution margin per unit, but they only require one minute. So per that one minute, 
they generate $12 for contribution margin. So things turn around a little bit. If you have that constraining factor, the minutes of the stitching machine, then we only can generate $7.50 per minute if we produce and sell mountain panniers as opposed to $12 per unit to produce and sell touring panniers. Let's add that to here. Let's see, we have contribution margin we just computed a minute ago, 15 and 12. Additional units can be produced in one hour, 30 and 60. So the additional contribution margin that we produce for each of these would be 450 and 720 per hour. Okay, let's continue. I told you this would be complicated, so let's look at this a little bit further. The monthly demand for touring paneer, 7,000. They require one minute. We only need 7,000 minutes. That means we have 5,000 minutes left over, and it takes two minutes to produce the mountain paneer. That means we can produce 2,500 of those units. So when we go back and see if we can use the minutes more efficiently and have more contribution per, per minute, we need to produce, first of all, the touring paneers as much as possible. Then with the time left over, after we hit the maximum demand for touring, then we can start producing the mountain paneers and generate 750 per minute. That's what they're showing us here. With this computation, let's produce all the touring paneers we can. Then with the minutes left over, produce the mountain paneers. If we do that, the contribution margin per unit is 15 per mountain. If we produce 2,500, there's a total contribution margin. Touring paneers, contribution margin per unit 12. If we produce all 7,000 of those, 84,000 contribution margin. So this would maximize our contribution margin, 121.5. By going back and finding out that we do have a limited resource here, stitching machine, we need to find out how can we use that limited resource as efficiently as possible to generate as much contribution margin as possible. That's what these schedules are showing us how to do that and put it all together. This would be the maximum contribution margin we could generate by really watching closely how we use that constraining resource. Go ahead and read this example about Subaru yourself and uh, read the rest of, the, of this page yourself in a couple of pages. It talks more about the constraining factor. This page discusses joint product cost and then whether to take those joint, joint products and sell them now or process them further and maybe increase revenues somewhat. So it always sounds good to increase revenues, but you have to watch the cost. So here we have the sell or process further decision we have to come up with. First of all, some definitions, joint products. These are two or more products that are produced from a common input. Okay, sounds good. The split off point. This is the point in the manufacturing process where some or all the joint products can be recognized as individual products. So you start with raw materials, produce them to a certain point. At that point, the split off point, then you have individual products coming out of that. We'll see an example in just a minute. Sell a process for the decision. What is this? A decision whether a joint product should be sold at the split off point or sold after further processing. And finally, joint cost. These are costs that are incurred up to the split off point in a process that produces joint products. Let's look at an example to, to help hopefully clear this up. Here we have the, uh, let me get the scrolling here, uh, right there. Okay. Sorry about that. No. Okay, I gotta stop here, okay. Now, the process, we, we get wool from the sheep, of course, and we go through a process, and then the part right here, we separate the wool out, and this is the spill-off point. After a process, we have some coarse wool, fine wool, and super fine wool. So this is the joint process, the joint products. They incurred all together a cost of $40,000. And now at this point, we have three separately identifiable products. 
we have a decision. Should we sell them at this level? And you can see the selling price we could get. We could get $120,000 for the coarse wool. We could sell the fine wool for $150,000 or the undyed uh, super fine wool for $60,000. Sell it here or process it further by dyeing it for buying the, the wool, dyeing the wool. And so if we dye the wool, here's the cost. And if we do dye the wool, we can sell the, the wool at a higher price. So instead of receiving 120, we can sell the wool for 160. It costs us 50,000 to do that, so we need to look at this pretty close in a minute. On the fine wool, instead of selling for 150, let's process it further by dyeing it for a $60,000 cost. Sell it for 240. And then super fine wool, you can either sell it now for $60,000 or spend $10,000 to dye it and then sell it for $90,000. So what should we do? Like I said earlier, it always looks good to increase your revenues. So should we go from 120 to 160 for the coarse wool? Should we go from 150 to 240 or from 60 to 90? Whatever you decide for any of these products, that's a decision for that product. So for example, you could decide to sell the undyed coarse wool here, not dye it, but you could still take the fine wool and the super fine wool, dye it, and sell it at the higher price. So let's put the numbers to this. Currently, if you dye all three of the types of wool, here are the results. Combined sales, and the 490 comes from right here, you can see at the top. Here's the cost of the wool separating the wool, the dyeing cost, all the cost, 360, so the profit would be $130,000. Let's break it down between product. On the coarse wool, remember the, filing, the final selling price is 160. We could have sold it at the split off point at 120. So we could increase revenue by $40,000 if we process it further and sell it for 160 as compared to 120. But it cost us $50,000 to do that. If we dyed the coarse wool for $50,000 cost and we only increase revenues 40, we're going to lose $10,000. For the fine wool, we're okay. Also the super fine wool. So here, if we dye the fine wool, we can sell it for 240 as opposed to selling it at the split off point at 150. So 90,000 increase in revenue. It costs only 60,000 to do that. So we would increase our revenue by $30,000, you know, net revenue. Super fine wool, similar. We could sell it for 90 if we spend 60, no, sell it for 90. We could have sold it for 60, $30,000 increase in revenue. It cost us only 10,000 to do that. So our profits would go up $20,000. So you can see here, we should process the fine wool <clears throat> and the super fine wool more, but not process the coarse wool. So put these numbers together by not pro you know, processing the coarse wool. Here are the results. Combined sales by not processing the coarse wool, we're down to 450, but we save some money. The dyeing costs are a lot less. These don't change here. So the costs are only 310 total our profit is 140. So the 10,000 we would lose if we process and diet further on the 130 profit can be shown here. Let's don't process the, the coarse wool further. And here is the profit of 140. So that's the decision you make at the split off point. Should you sell it as is or spend money to process it further and as is here, I should say, or spend money to process it further and sell it at a higher price. Make sure you read these two paragraphs and this will talk about the importance of knowing whether a traceable cost is an avoidable cost or not. Just because the cost can be traced to a particular product doesn't mean it's not avoidable. Maybe you can avoid that cost even if it's traceable. So read that and then Okay, we're at the end of the chapter. So there's quite a bit in this chapter. This is sort of a long video. But again, go back and read the chapter in detail and come back and, re and review the video again to explain the uh, 
the examples that was as we go through here. So as usual, you know, study hard and good luck with your studies.